right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to have a different type of session than we've normally been doing, something kind of new, a little bit free form, a little bit easy, uh, and hopefully here and available for you all and, and to make it uh, you know, a really nice, valuable session for you all. Um, we're, we're going to cover today is really some 101 of, of Cockroach Labs and Cockroach DB and kind of what we're all about. But before we get started, let me just do a couple of little housekeeping things. Um, please do ask questions. So, you know, today's session is really all about, you know, um, asking or, or answering questions that we get from the audience. You know, we, we do a fair amount of webinars here. We get a lot of questions, a lot of engagement from people um when 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 you know we do these things and we just wanted to give a forum for people to ask questions but we wanted to give a forum for people to ask you know very general questions as well so there is a qa panel so please do ask questions there um alternatively you can do it in the chat i have no preference uh, i kind of like the chat honestly um, it's a little easier for me to manage but I'm, I'm good with either um a recording will be available after the event and i wanted to thank you all for joining us um the session today, I, I, we have a couple of topics um, that we're going to talk through, and I want to, I'll introduce our, our panelists here in the, in the next slide. Um, but we have some really deep expertise um, with CockroachDB uh, and distributed systems and distributed databases and, and, and kind of range of, of lots of different things to talk about data for sure. Um, you know, but this session today, you know, sometimes at the end of a session, people will say, oh man, I wish you told me it was like a, a basic session or a more advanced session. Um, this is kind of a, an, an intro. Uh, it's a more earlier in your in your career or interest in in cockroach uh, cockroach database, uh, and so I just wanted to put that out there first. You know, I'll, I will, we'll we'll dive deep in, in a couple areas and stuff, um, but really it's wherever this audience um, wants to go. So the collection of people here, uh, any questions you want. Um, like I said, I do have a, a basic theme of of some things that we'll talk through, and I'll and I'll weave the questions in along the way. Um, as, as we get into the session. So thank you all for joining. Please ask questions. And without further ado, I think I want to present my panel. So guys, let's go on video so that people can see your beautiful faces and wherever you are. Awesome, thank you. All right, so uh, smiling panelists, I love it. So uh, from left to right here. So welcome, Tim. Tim, can you give us a little bit about, let's say, who you are? And what your role here as is at Cockroach Labs, and uh, and what what you what what do you like about what you do? Uh, yeah, great. Uh, so Tim Vale, uh, been at Cockroach Labs for about a year and a half. I head up our sales engineering team, which means um, I get to spend uh, nearly every day uh, talking with our prospects and customers from all over the world, and that's really what I like best about uh, the job that I do is just the opportunity to interact with people who are solving some really interesting problems using what obviously I think to be a really interesting technology to do it. So um, that's it. I'm, I'm coming awesome. to you live from Atlanta. Live from, I'm live from New York City. I have worked with Tim y'all for, I think this is the third time I've worked with you. I think I first met you back, I don't know, eight, nine years ago or something. So your beard has been growing since I think. It has been. Look, it has. It's looking good. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very popular at home, but uh, yes. <laughs> well, with dogs and cats, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, looking forward to it. And then, uh, Rich, welcome. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. My name is Rich Loveland. I'm a technical writer on the education team. I've uh, been at Cockroach TV for about two years, and um, you know, I've worked with a few of the different kind of like engineering sub teams within Cockroach TV. So like. Uh, Right now, working on like KB and that layer, kind of the low level stuff. And, um, you know, I've worked with the SQL team in the past, the teams that do the schema changes. And um, I just, I'm really fascinated by distributed systems and, uh, you know, can't claim to be an expert, but I've been sitting, sitting at the side of some people who are experts and uh, it's been a really fun ride so far. Rich, you are a world more of an expert than you think, I think. Sometimes, you know. So um, thank you both for joining me today. Um, you know, I, 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 hopefully this will be a good conversation. I, I can't imagine it won't be. I mean, we have such a really good level and depth of experience, but broad too. So, you know, to the audience, you know, you have Tim who's been focused in very deep customer problems, things that people are seeing. And then, you know, Rich has been interacting very deeply with our engineering team uh, intimately. And if you all haven't checked out the docs for Cockroach Labs, I, I would 
how do you suggest you do it? And why we have somebody from that team on the program today, Rich, thank you. Because and I, on behalf of everybody in the world, actually, like the, the docs are tremendous. And so, wow, yeah. Thank you, Jim. That's yeah. very kind. Yeah, well, I've been in open source for a while. I think Tim will laugh when I mention this, but I've been part of open source projects in the past where you wouldn't even push people towards the docs. Like, don't go there. It's, it's, it's not good. So no, I think we we stake take claim of like incredible documentation. Uh, y'all, Rich is one of the key people who takes these really really complex topics and makes it easy for y'all to to adopt. So I had to give you that first, buddy. But there's there's a whole team of you, right? There's how many people working in docs? Oh, six give or take. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely one of the highest uh, ratios of tech writers to engineers that I've had at pre, you know various employers. So that's, yeah. that's been a good sign. Yeah, and, and documentation has been part of Cockroach Labs from the very beginning. Um, I think Jesse, who leads up that team, how long has he been with us, Rich? And I just wanted to give a sense of her how long we've been doing this. I think he joined about two years before I did. I think he's yeah. well past four years at this point. Yeah. He's been around since there were about 14 or 15 people at the company, I think. Yeah, and so in open source, having very clear and wonderful documentation, I think is probably one of the most important things for adoption because it makes it easy for everybody out there who wants to try this thing, so. Tim, I think you learned through our documentation, didn't you? I do learn through the documentation. In fact, I have it up right now, just in case people ask me a question that I can't answer, which happens every day. And uh, and my resource is obviously the documentation. So it is great stuff. Yep. So again, Rich, thank you. And, uh, and on behalf of all of us out here, the audience and uh, everybody internally, you know, thanks for everything you guys do. because it's, it's a huge piece, but it's a really good set of people that we have here today. I'm gonna actually stop sharing so you all can see our faces I think it's a little bit more personal this way. So you have all of us in a, in a cockroach lab symbol. So um, I have a couple topics. Again, everybody, if you wanna ask questions, chat, QA, whatever, along the way, please do. I, I gotta ask though, before we get started, and this is a little bit off of our, our script that we actually pre-talked about, guys, we spoke about before, about a, you know, a little bit ago. The name cockroach, right? It, you both smile, don't you? Like, you? like, my sense is people love it or hate it, they all remember it, right? And so. Do you have any funny stories about, you know, just the name or like, you know, you're, you're joining this company and, and, and working for a place with, with this, with this you know, kind of legendary name, I guess? Well, I will say, I mean, people do have, as you well know, uh, a very visceral reaction to it. Uh, we've certainly worked with some, you know, prospects who ultimately became customers who, you know, kind of right out of the gate were like, you know, there's just no way I can take this to my boss for a signature. <laughs> Um, you know, so, so we've certainly got our fair share of that. You know, the story I always tell, and it's not that fascinating is or exciting is, you know, I've been in technology for a long time. As you know, technology companies have, have interesting names. Um, my mother hasn't known where I've worked for the better part of 15 years. She couldn't remember it to save her life. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, but she all, I mean... It, she absolutely knows where I work. There was today the one because, with the elephant. There yeah, was I mean, the, the one with the one. elephant. It's like, what? Yeah. What is this? Um, but she knows exactly where I work. So we yeah. have a lot of fun with it. I, I, you know, I think it's a great name. Yes, it. it I wish I could tell you it, it hasn't alarmed people, but it has. But it's a. It, it it speaks so much to what we really are. I think as the it, kind of the fabric of the technology is, as you well know, um, yeah, it's, that it's, it's, it's important. It's very descriptive, actually, in many ways. It is. So it's actually Absolutely. pretty perfect. So, Rich, have you, did you have any funny run-ins with the name? Um, no funny run-ins. I just, I'll, I've noted, as have many people internally, that every time there's a discussion online, like on Hacker News or something, uh, there's always at least sort of like one or two comments that are about the name and, you know, kind of mentioning what you already said. and Yeah. I'm not going to show it to everyone because, uh, you know, people have different thresholds for this, but I did get this award at work and it's this like, it's a very large, very yucky looking cockroach kind of encased in plastic and uh, I try not to look at it too much. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's what we are, Rich. <laughs> we, we, we get to look at each other. So uh, yeah, internally we, we, we lovingly call ourselves roachers. Uh, so. I guess that is like the highest like cockroach one on one I could start with, with which is the name, um, you know. But let's let's get into this and let's get in a little bit about the database, um, you know. So I, I think we we each come to have to explain what we do. Tim, with your parents or your family, you know. Rich, I'm sure that your interactions with in social circles or even with professionals, you know. And 
you know, explaining Cockroach DB to me at the very beginning was a little bit difficult, right? Because it's like, yeah, it's a database, but it's different. Let me explain. And, you know, I had like this five minute diatribe of like this thing and distributed micro craziness, right? So I'm interested in how you guys describe Cockroach DB um, to your friends. Rich, let's start with you. Like, how, how do you describe it? Uh, I guess at the highest, highest level, I would say it's, it's, it's just like running any other database, except that you can have it running on multiple computers and they all talk to each other without you having to do anything. And they, they just synchronize with each other and you can pretend it's one logical database, but it runs on many computers. Right. So uh, distributed database, basically, right? Tim, how do you get, how do you, how do you answer this? Like, well, I think, you know, it, it's funny. I, it, it, for me, it all starts with the name. And I mean, I, I know we just briefly mentioned it, but, but the way I, I like to talk about it, I mean, certainly if we're having a technical conversation, it's a little bit different, but you know, it's a database that's hard to kill. Um, just like yeah. a, a cockroach, um, or, you know, is hard to kill it. And that implies lots of things. And it really implies what Rich was talking about, which is, you know, it's a bunch of, a bunch of computers working together to solve a really complex problem uh, for yeah. data storage and access. But at the end of the day, uh, it's a database that is phenomenally hard to kill. And, um, and I think uh, although there are lots of other kind of value props, if you will, for cockroach, that's, that's one that I think people that resonate with people right out of the gate because of the name. Yeah. And it's always on, always available. Yeah, you, can't that kill it. you can't get it. It's a cockroach. You, you just can't get rid of them. I mean, that's right. I, uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I never, I didn't live in New York until about a year and a half ago. So I guess I, I'm just becoming more aware of the visceral nature of, of the sentiment behind this. Um, but it's interesting, Tim, you know, uh, the, the name does dep depict something that's mm -hmm. kind of very, very, you know, resilient, I think is the word. Um, what, how are people using us? Like you're, you're in touch with, you talk yeah. to a lot of people who are using CockroachDB. Yep. In the field. I think, Rich, you're talking to the people who are building it. Like, you know, and so it's kind of like, we're looking down into engineering and looking out into customers. So let, let me start with you, Tim, in terms of like, how are people using this today, right? Like, if, is, it, is it the resilience thing? What, what's the primary stuff they're looking for? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, everybody's a little bit different. And uh, and I think there are some unique capabilities of Cockroach, which attract to different people at different times. Um, there are a couple, I think, main themes. Uh, one is, is is modernization in a lot of ways. You know, folks want to uh, to build um, a new back-end architecture for uh, front-end architecture that's likely undergone lots of modifications recently. You know, folks are moving to microservices, moving to Kubernetes, and are realizing that the, the level of scalability that containerization and um, and other types of uh, services and infrastructure like Kubernetes bring to the front end are, are really very applicable to the back end and want that same kind of benefit. And so we're seeing quite a bit of, hey, you know, can I run my database in Kubernetes like I'm running my app layer? Right. Uh, that's a really interesting thing that, that people are, are looking forward to doing. Uh, want to do. The other thing is just being able to run a kind of in any type of infrastructure. Hey, I, I want to run across multiple clouds or I want to run across on-prem or in the cloud. I mean, these are things that, these are real problems that people want us to solve. Resiliency, scale, performance, uh, but do it in a, in a uniquely modern way um, that, uh, that can't be done today with kind of traditional providers. So, I mean, everybody's a little bit different, but uh, a lot of the, this kind of theme of multi-cloud resiliency, Kubernetes, modernization, yeah. I don't know, probably a terrible answer, Jim. Oh, never but, a bad um, answer from you, buddy. The, but yeah, but we see, everybody's a little different. Um, yeah. And we can talk a little bit about use cases, but I, I think that's kind of why people are coming in a lot yeah, of and ways. It's just, you know, you would need a transactional relational database that's going to have those characteristics. That's where people are going with it. So. I think what we're showing is like, yeah, I think people are transforming and they're building out and they're thinking of new ways of designing systems. I will argue that our team has actually been doing that, right? Like we actually have taken a database and said, okay, wait, let's re-architect this for something that's net new. It's almost like we're migrating from an old world database mindset to a new world database mindset, right? And mm -hmm. the new world is this distributed services-based um, you know, um, 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 you know, like the, all these concepts that you, you shared nothing, the atomic unit is one thing, like all this, the, the core principles of becoming kind of cloud native. And we built a cloud native database. So Rich, let me ask you, like, and, and you've kind of had a good front row seat for the last two years. What do you think has been some of the most challenging parts of Cockroach database to build, right? Like if you look at the engineering team and some of the stuff, set, you know, that 
that that has been a challenge for us and and, and nothing's easy right like uh, if if we if this was easy i tell you what a lot of people would be doing stuff like this what what do you think has been some of the most challenging the biggest challenges we've had you know with distributed systems and building a database well with the uh, standard disclaimer that i'm not the one doing it so it's just oh, my, i know kind of from outside their world and there are things that get talked about that i don't always understand uh full disclosure there um I think just um, it's one thing to make things run in test environments. There's oh, we're always learning yeah. things from customers, things that customers are trying to do, and then they'll filter in through support teams, through sales engineering, et cetera. And the engineering teams just try to do the work to make it more magical, basically. Right. Make it easy, it's kind of our slogan. And you know, I think over time it's it's always like some resiliency type stuff. Performance is another thing because you can be resilient, but being slow is another type of right. uh, serious problem. Like if something slows way down, then it might as well almost be down sometimes in some use right. cases. Um, correctness is always a concern. And actually that's something that's always impressed me a lot. Like we have a really high um, consistency level, serializability, and that means that you can trust this database. So I think it's, you know, and folks internally are always really worried about that. Right. And they, as all that's happening, as the kind of resiliency, performance, the trust with serialization, serializability level, there's also um, more features, you know, better Postgres compatibility is kind of always a thing. It's like we're asymptotically moving towards, you know, this better and better every day, better drivers, better support for drivers, you know, better documentation from my end. So yeah, it's just, I don't know if that's a bit of a, well, I, 50 point answer but no well it is and it's it's everything complicated honestly and you don't know what you don't know until you get there right like i think you know it's funny i was talking to an analyst uh a friend of mine from gartner who's just there some these guys have been analyzing databases for 20 years and they they said something to me they said it takes about seven years for a database to fully gestate before it's kind of really strong and enterprise ready because like it's the corner cases that kill you. And I think that's what you're saying, Rich. It's like, it's like this stuff that we're learning now as, as we get into these larger production environments, that's the stuff gets, that's, it's really, really difficult because I think last year we had this problem. It was, I, we internally was called like atomic replication and it had to do with like broadly distributed clusters and like stuff that like the etcd team, if you're, if you're all on the, on the line are familiar with etcd as a technology, they haven't even dealt with yet because they haven't had federated clusters. Right. And so like, we're dealing with things not only in a database that gets complex, but like, like in a, in a distributed world. So it's like complexity on top of complexity, and it's a it's a very difficult. I I, I think Rich, it's a, exactly right. I mean, it's like it's the corner cases in which we're coming up with. And so you know, I know you 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 are tasked with describing some pretty deep technical concepts. You know what I mean? Um, if there's like one area in our docs for people to go and kind of check out to start to, you know, where, where, do, you, where do you suggest people get started from that point of view, just to get a better understanding of kind of, because it is technical, right? Like, where, where do people start? I know there's a good front page, but like, what do you think is best, Rich? Well, I guess there's two ways. There's, there's kind of uh, outside in where you can just learn SQL and just fire up Cockroach DB. You can do one node. You, you can run one okay. to n nodes, right? So you can start from that level if you just want to develop your app and test it. And if you wanted to learn about some of the underpinnings and architecture and how data gets shuffled around and made consistent, we have this section called the architecture docs. Uh, that you can look at and it kind of breaks things into layers like KV or uh, storage layer, SQL layer, et cetera. Right. And that's a good place to learn some of the concepts. And then I guess ideally, like you don't have to know those things unless you're trying to do stuff that's like super complex or scale super huge. But ideally there's this whole sweet spot area from like, you know, one to some number of nodes and some amount of data where you don't have to care about any of that. Right. Period. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, ultimately, this is just a relational database. We're wire compatible with Postgres. It should just be SQL, right? So for the standard developer who isn't worried about latencies and resilience and, you know, I mean, can I create a table? Can I select star, where, blah, you know what I mean? So, you know, from, blah, you know, and I think it's just SQL ultimately. So, I, you know, funny enough, Rich, I, I learned with a single node here and I, I went three nodes and I started killing and on my Mac. So, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things. So. Tim, how did you go about learning everything about Cockroach? Was it was it the docs? 
It, it well, it was two things. It's certainly the docs, and I and I would uh, echo Rich's comment about the, the architecture reference. You know, so often when when in my job we have to kind of describe what cockroach is, people, you know, to some extent, the purpose of this call, you know, what the heck is this thing, and, and why should I care, and how is it different? And I think really unpacking and understanding our architecture as described by those that section of the docs is just really really important. It really sets the stage. I think a foundational understanding for yeah. how and why we're different. But for me. You know, to really learn anything, and certainly to learn a database, is to do something with it. To um, you know, to, to interact with it. And one of the nice things about the docs, and certainly uh, about how I learned, was you know, there's a lot of like you know, just hey, you know, run this command, do this kind of stuff. How to get up and running in Kubernetes? How to get up and running in Docker? Right. And how to build an app? You know, yes, these are simple apps, they're trivial apps, but just going through the exercise of actually spinning up a cluster um, in some environment that I was interested in, and actually writing code that touches that environment yeah. in a language that I was interested in uh, has been incredibly important. And yeah. just so you know, I, um, just an extension of this, we hadn't talked about this, but I, I know I'm, I'm giving a talk on this uh, in a couple of weeks. You know, at Cockroach, we have this concept called dog fooding is good, where uh, a cockroach uh, will pay for you to, um, for the hosting costs essentially for applications that you might want to build um, and run on top of Cockroach. And I took advantage of that, you know, and so I've got an application that I've built and continue to maintain and host. And it was an incredible learning experience of yeah. not only how to build applications and run against Cockroach, but really operating a Cockroach cluster. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just, it, we offer, I think a lot of ways, both externally and internally to kind of get your, um, wrap your head around what we do. And um, both from more of an academic reading, like our blogs, a fantastic resource our blogs are, uh, to actually just sitting in hands-on keyboard doing stuff. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, for me, it's hands-on as well, Tim. And I think we're, you know, and, and kudos to the, the entire education uh, rich team, the, the, the education team rich, you know, building out even further code samples in, in Python and Go and Java and all, that's all in the work. We're doing a lot of work around that. Rich, there's also Cockroach Demo, which I think is a pretty important part of this whole learning exercise. Can you just describe what Cockroach Demo is for the just the broad audience? Because I think, you know, to me, like, I've never seen that before, and I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that was built uh, by Jordan Lewis, one of the folks on our team. And um, basically, you just type Cockroach space demo enter and it fires up a whole cockroach DB like in memory. You don't have to worry about where the data is getting stored. It's totally ephemeral. So, you know, you wouldn't put anything in there that you really are worried about or want to keep, but it's just something that you fire up in a second and you play it. and you have the web UI and you can go look at it and see the various things that are happening. You can type queries into it. Uh, I believe there's even some stuff where it will load up uh, test tables for you with a couple of subcommands or well, something. Yeah, you get you get whole workloads like TPCC, I think, is in there, and ah, nice. our mover workload is there, right, Tim? I think you're saying you could set up a nine-node cluster. There's just a command line argument you throw in there, right? Like, yeah, you know, and I, just to cut, you didn't ask me, but I'll just make a comment. I mean, not only is demo, you? um, huh? You're like, I gotta talk about demo. I gotta talk. Um, you know, not only demo is demo really interesting, but I think generally speaking, you know, for, for those of you on the call who may be interested in kind of getting started with Cockroach, I mean, one of the neat things I think about that whole process is we make it that simple to get going. You know, it's a single binary, yeah. um, exposes two ports. Um, you know, there's just not much to it. Every node is the same, you know, and, and you and I both came from, you know, large distributed systems where, you know, getting up and running was, it was an act of Congress. It was a, a lot of hardware and a lot of software and all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, this is not, it's very, very simple. Get it running in Docker, get it running in Kubernetes and, or just get it running using Cockroach Demo. I think we've worked really hard to eliminate that kind of early friction in getting started. Um, because at the end of the day, people want to understand why is Cockroach different? You know, what is this like, or how is this compared to other things that I may be more familiar with? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the faster we can get people uh, into that journey, the better. And so Cockroach Demo is a great tool for that, but there are other ways to just get started simply. Yeah, and I, it's a key thing. So let, let's, I, I, I can't be more of an advocate for Cockroach Demo and Docs because honestly, that's the way I, and if a marketing guy can learn it and start doing some things, y'all, like it, it's pretty straightforward, you know, making data easy is pretty easy at that. You know, I'm a marketing guy. Um, if so, you can do it, anybody can. Oh my God. Any, you know, so anyone. Let's, actually, let's talk about distributed systems. And you mentioned, Tim, like other systems and they're difficult to get going. Yep. So, you know, we often get asked, 
you know, okay, this is great. How are you different than NoSQL then, right? Because mm -hmm. NoSQL is scalable, right? Like NoSQL databases are resilient. I mean, I, I, I've used Cassandra in the past, you know what I mean? Like there's some other solutions out there. How are we different than that? Tim, let's go with you, Tim, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there are a lot of, lot of ways that we're different. I, I think the way I like to answer this question is, um, you know, SQL or NoSQL systems to me in my mind are kind of on this natural evolution of persistent storage mechanisms, you know, starting with very traditional relational databases uh, that you had to scale vertically. And that was just it. That's all you could do uh, to add more capacity, you had to add more right. hardware. And I think the natural evolution in a lot of ways was I, people needing to figure out how can I scale these systems horizontally. But at the time when that happened, they lost an important portion or a piece of the puzzle. And that was SQL semantics. That was ACID. That was, you know, transactions. And so we kind of moved into this no SQL world where, yes, we got horizontal scalability, but we lost a, a lot of other really important things. And I think what's really interesting about Cockroach is this idea that we've kind of married these two concepts together in a very, very nice way. So we can scale horizontally like no SQL systems. Uh, we can do it very, very easily and, and get all of the resilience and performance characteristics you would expect from a system that can scale out. But to an end user, um, to somebody who is consuming the cockroach database, it's going to look and feel just yeah. like a traditional relational database. So that means right. it's rows and columns, it's tables, it's indexes, it's joins, it's the SQL language. It's Postgres, man. It's Postgres. Hey, what do you know? Uh, exactly. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing for folks. There's been a lot of, a lot of just angst about, like, geez, you know, I, I no SQL isn't isn't the solution for the problem I have, um, yeah. but I need a scale out system. What do I do? Well, Cockroach mm -hmm. is one of those answers. Yeah. So I, I always think about this as kind of like, you know, when they figured out NoSQL databases, the key thing was they kind of took the guardrails off in terms of transactions, right? Yeah. Like, okay, I'm going to get really fast. So people can access data and talk across the entire plan. And I get, it's like a CDN almost like, mm -hmm. but it's every, you know, like, awesome. Let's take the guardrails off around transactions. It's almost like we took that same thing, but we had to put guardrails back on for transactions basically, right? Like in many ways, right? And so like, how do you take that and do that? It takes time. Um, but let's, let's get, let's actually dive down a little bit. Um, because I think it's, uh, you know, let's get a little tight. You guys, you know, I'm asking a bunch of easy questions. Let's get into a little bit more d d deeper, right? And so, so this is now the rich, we're entering the rich phase of this conversation. Rich zone. We're entering rich zone. We're, we're rich oh, no. on the spot now. Rich is like, Good, I like wait, that. Wait, 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 wait a second. So I want to talk about, um, two key concepts in, in yeah. cockroach that when I started to understand these things is when I really saw the power of cockroach. One of them is raft and the, and the other is, is how we do partitioning range partitioning. And Cassandra will do hash partitioning. If people are familiar with how those things work, it's, it's like sharding. And so mm -hmm. I want to talk about those two things, but let, let's start with raft because I think it is kind of a core principle within, within cockroach database that that is kind of important to understand because it's a distributed consensus protocol. Well, distributed, right? So we're distributing data. It's, it's consensus. Okay, consent. Like, so so. Let me. I'm going to start with Rich. Um, good. Good. Tim, you talk a lot. Get right? over there, Rich. You talk a lot. And, and when you guys are both like, oh God, not me. No. Rich, how geez, do you? I, geez, I gotta go. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Rich, how do you explain Raft and kind of like how important is it for Cockroach DB as as kind of a baseline technology? You know, how how is it, you know what I mean? Well, it's tactically very important conceptually. Who knows if we'll use it forever, but RAF basically is a, uh, it was designed by some folks, I think out at Stanford, and it's a way of synchronizing state across different systems. And it's a way of knowing that you're doing that in a way that's consistent and correct. And so, you know, I'm not that familiar, honestly, with the internal machinations of like how it does that. Yeah. But it's one of these protocols. There's another one called Paxos, which was developed by uh, Leslie Lamport, who's kind of a famous name in distributed systems, if any of y'all are familiar. But it, the idea is I have some state machine and it lives on this computer. And then I have another state machine on computer B and then another one on computer C. And I update some value in the one on my local machine, similar to doing an insert statement in SQL. And then these different distributed state machines talk to each other and the protocol by which they talk to each other to make sure that they always have consistently updated correct information about some value in this case the value in your database you just inserted 
Um, that's that's what it does. Yep. The gossip protocol. I know exactly, right, Tim? I think actually, I think I think I got the idea. Webinar. I think we should have a contest who could describe things best and then like we'll have I both. Mean, why why are you get me on the phone with a technical writer? You know these guys can, <laughs> can describe it much better than I can. Tim, I mean, do you get into these conversations? Are you are you describing raft out there? How I do you try to the customers in terms of No, it, it, it is it is enormously important. Um it, because it helps, it does help explain kind of, you know, a really at a, at a fundamental level how we work and why we work. That really in the second topic, which is range partitioning, because again, you know, people are familiar with other systems, you know, um, there's, there's a long history of, of databases and distributed systems. So, you know, folks want to fundamentally understand why cockroach is different and, and what makes us unique. And, and part of it is exactly what we're describing is um, how we treat data under the hood. Obviously, we've talked about at the, at the top level, it's just a SQL engine, but at the bottom level, it's something different. It's been engineered from the ground up to solve some of these really complex problems. And, and part of the solution has been or is, um, you know, managing these, these ranges or shards of data, um, distributing them around the cluster, right. uh, keeping them consistent and accurate. And the way we do that um, is, is via or at least in part uh, via the raft consensus algorithm or protocol. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, it's, it, it really, we end up spending quite a bit of time actually, uh, certainly in, in, in deeper conversations, explaining these fundamental concepts so that, that yeah. people walk away with an understanding of, of what makes cockroach unique and, yeah, and, and ready to tackle some of these big challenges like resiliency. I mean, it's a really big, important thing too, because I, I, I the way you describe it, Tim is great. Cause it's like, I always think of databases as three layers the way it presents itself, the language in which one interacts with it. In this case, it's SQL, which, mm -hmm. which you know, I mean, I think the world is pretty familiar with. Um, ultimately, underneath, data gets stored to a disk somewhere. So there's storage, right? Like, and, and that actually becomes very different in a distributed system as well. And then in between those two is something called SQL execution, the execution layer. And in distributed systems, that's complex, right? Like, you know, you and I well, both- it needs to be. You know, it should it, be. No, it's it, it, it's 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 a requirement, right? And if you know, I, you and I both come from you know the MapReduce and Hadoop mm -hmm. thing, and you know distributing queries out and then mapping and then reducing back to something. And those sort of core concepts are are actually really critical. Mm -hmm. They aren't critical to understand because ultimately, I think the developer is just writing SQL. However, you know there are some key things here, like Raft is used to basically coordinate when a transaction is going to work, and I, I, how am I blocking data if I'm using across different tables and you know, how do I make sure that data is right? But we're also storing data a little bit differently, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, Raft is one part of it, but this, the storage yep. layer and, mm -hmm. and the way that we actually write data to disk is different as well. I mean, the, the name cockroach is comes from this resilience and this resilience mm -hmm. is really kind of born in the way that we, we replicate data, right? And so, Tim, I don't know how to start this conversation. I would love to end it talking about ranges, mm. but I'm done talking because I'm supposed to be the host. Mm. Um, but I love this topic because this is the stuff that really, really made me start to understand what we do. And so can you talk a little bit about replication? Because I think that's a key point of, of Raft and that's the bridge between Raft and storage and, and, and kind of what we do around that. Yeah, so a, a couple things, uh, but I did want to make a quick point about, um, about ultimately everything that we're going to talk about here. And I think it, it kind of, again, speaks to the essence of Cockroach a little bit. There are no shortcuts to do this well and to do it right. No. Um, you know, and, and so you will hear us say, uh, certainly out in the field, if, if anybody on this call has ever had a meeting with us, you'll hear us say, you know, engineered from the ground up. And there's real meaning in those simple words. I mean, we have been purpose built to solve this very complex series of problems that all revolve around kind of distributed data storage and access. Um, and there are no shortcuts to do that right. We fundamentally don't believe that's why we've invested so much time and energy in doing this right from the ground up. Um, so anyway, uh, kind of to your specific question. So ultimately, um, under the hood, Cockroach is a distributed key value store. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's a database the, on top of a database. It's a database on top of a database. Again, I, I can't stress this enough, particularly for a one on one oh one type conversation. What the end users are going to see is a SQL engine. They're going to write and access uh, data um, using SQL. It's going to look like a Postgres database specifically to them. But under the hood, it's a distributed key value store. And so, you know, the, you kind of mentioned different layers. Well, there's a whole lot of space between executing a SQL statement and storing something in a key value store way down at the And so we have a lot of kind of architectural layers that help achieve this translation. But at the end of the day, what we have to do 
is um, uh, carve up data into something. We call them ranges, um, which is this kind of atomic unit of operation in Cockroach. It's a 512 meg chunk of the key value space uh, that we copy uh, by default three times around the cluster. So this, this chunk of data we'll, we'll call a range. That range is copied three times by default. And the process of keeping all of those ranges up to date is raft, right? Um, right. Particularly on writes. So, you know, this idea of what is a range, what is partitioning, what is raft, what is storage, ultimately what are key values are all really important concepts. They all kind of work together and, you know, go, just kind of bring the conversation to some extent full circle. You know, you talk about the architectural reference in the docs that, that Rich mentioned earlier. It's, it, we really break it down in this way, you know, this is start at the top and we go all the way down to, to the very bottom of the, the architectural layer, which is storage, which is key value. And we walk you through kind of what's happening in each one of those layers. And it's, it's a really fascinating journey. There's in fact, a, an article, I think a blog post called life of a distributed transaction that kind of walks mm -hmm. you through this really important to kind of learn how and why we're different. And again, I think the, the point I want to make is that each stage architectural stage we have built from the ground up essentially to do this the right way in this environment for this kind of current and modern set of problems that can't be said for a lot of other databases right and and these are some of the core concepts that you know the company was founded on and if anybody is really want to geeking out on these things um you know we recently published a paper um gosh it was like 14 engineers and a bunch of die a whole bunch of people uh, led by rebecca rebecca taft on our team um, you know, if anybody's familiar with Sigmod, if you ever want a really good deep dive into, into a lot of the, like I would, I would go check out our Sigmod paper too. I think we just published a blog post about that. Um, but I think also the, the Spanner white paper uh, that Google actually published, it talks about a lot of these concepts. And so I think it's kind of interesting. It's like any of the interesting technology right now that's happening in this kind of transformation, like Tim, you talked about how people are moving towards containers and microservices, like it's getting complex and, I, and we're doing the same thing internally with our own technology. A lot of this kind of came out of Google. Uh, this is this is really spawn of something that I think they were living in the future from 2005 to 2015. I don't know what future they're living in now. I would like to know because I want to go make a bet on the Super Bowl or something, you know. Um, you but but they, you know, they, you know, that that team and and what they built was it's just phenomenal. I mean, you know, the Kubernetes and, and and its its hold on on the community right now in kind of terms of how people are wanting to manage containerized and, and, and services-based systems is just, it's phenomenal. It's, is, it, is it too much? Is it, a, is it a tank when you just need a, a, a shotgun? Probably, but it's pretty awesome. You know what I mean? And so for us, like we, we, we also share one of these kind of core concepts with Spanner. And, and I think a lot of these core concepts were there. One of the, the one that was most important to me really was the, the KV stuff. And, and Rich, you work directly with the KV team, right? A, a fair amount. And you know, how, how do you explain KV, you know, to the, to the casual user, right? Like, what is your kind of description of it, right? Because this is the, that translation point between relational SQL and ultimately things being stored as a key value pair, right? That's a, that's a, that's a big jump, right? So how do, how do you go about explaining that? Well, as you know, you just said casual user, and I, I want to echo, I think Tim has said, and others of us have said, like, you don't have to know. If you're a if you're a SQL user, you're up at that layer and you're just interacting with SQL. Right. We've done our jobs right. The better we get at this, you know, the more we tweak things, the more we make things better, faster, etc. You'll have to know that less and less over time. Right. Um, but you know, yeah, it's, it's stuff stored on disk. At the end of the day, as Tim said, it's it's bits of data in a in a chunk size that are stored on disk, and the whole raft layer operates down there with those chunks. So you don't really even see it up here in SQL right. land. Uh, there are some things that you can do to kind of tweak it based on your uh, node layout and your cluster, which, you know, is more of an advanced topic, not really one-on-one. And, you know, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, and, and another thing that Tim brought up that I wanted to, to just kind of emphasize as well is like, this is all built from the ground up to do all of this synchronization correctly for you, the user. Like I was mentioning to Jim and Tim uh, a little earlier today before we did this, that at a previous company I worked at um, that was founded in like 2008 and they started with what they had then, which was MySQL. And they were building essentially a distributed system. 
but instead of getting one that's built principal, in a principled way by people or experts in distributed systems, such as Cockroach TV or such as Spanner or such as some of these other products, they had to do it themselves because it was 2008. So they started from MySQL and they were they built all their own tools to ship around this kind of binary data between instances of MySQL running on different machines. And they had to do it at a massive scale. This was a pretty big company in its space. And the engineers and folks internally spent so much time, they basically built their own entire version of this type of technology, but without raft, without any of the correctness protocols, all ad hoc, all debugging, data consistency issues at the wazoo, constantly having to fix things. And they spent like about a decade doing it give or take, and maybe they've switched to something else by now, or they've tuned their own systems to the point where they work well enough for them, probably the case. But in any case, that didn't exist then anyway, it was 2008. Right. But I, I just think this kind of technology can save engineering time, teams oh, yeah. so much time and pain. Like, you know, a friend of mine at that company I was just mentioning was on the data team and she would have to spend a lot of time and it was not fun work going through and reconciling data consistency issues and you know this was a brilliant engineer who in terms of value for the company if she hadn't had to do this she might have been able to spend some of that time and energy and effort on things that would actually be providing a lot more value for the company but instead they were kind of cleaning up a little bit of a mess a lot of the time so it's kind of like you get this out of the box now you know? yeah so and I, it's a really important thing. I, you know, honestly, I, I used to code a long time ago, y'all. Um, and back in 2008, 2009, we were building basically a services-based system. We were taking data from lots of different places, lots of queues. And que we set up this whole like queuing system. And one day, you know what? Somebody put this technology in front of us called BEA Tuxedo, which is like the beginning of web logic and like services and SOA. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like you guys just saved me like three months of scope. I think it's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, people are bothering themselves with sharding a data. Like, think about just sharding a database and like just the whole concept of not having to do this, right? And so, Tim, how often do you get in those conversations with people about that? And there's been a couple of questions. And I'm yeah, I was going to say there's a there's a question here I really want to answer, Jim, because we had our first question. And I think we ought to stop what we're doing and answer this question because I want more questions. All right, you go for it. Questions of field. So, actually, really good question. So I'll, I'll read it and then I'll answer because I think it's kind of neat. So some of the functionality in Postgres is not yet implemented in Cockroach. I guess this plays to the point of it, that it's designed from the ground up, get the fundamentals right before adding all the bells and whistles, right? Uh, but how important is it that the SQL layer behaves as closely as possible to Postgres? Well, I think it's a really insightful question. I mean, uh, thank you for recognizing, A, that, uh, that we're Postgres compatible, and we are. And just to clarify this, so we've implemented uh, the Postgres wire protocol. Maybe that's a distinction that's unimportant. But at the, to the end user, in effect, uh, you're going to execute nearly everything that you could execute against a Postgres database, against a Cockroach database. There are a couple things that we don't do yet, and I can explain what those are. But I think one of the key points I do want to make is that when connecting to a Cockroach database, you don't, we, we, you don't download a Cockroach driver uh, for Java or for C Sharp or for whatever language you're working in. Uh, you just download a Postgres driver and connect to a Cockroach database. So it's very important. This concept of Postgres compatibility is incredibly important to us. It's something that we work really hard on and have worked on uh, for a number of years. There are basically three big things that, we, that Postgres today does that we don't do, and they're as follows. One, stored procedures. Two, triggers. And three, geospatial. Uh, Postgres, our store procedures are not something we plan to do, at least not right away. Triggers are solved by something we call CDC which we can talk about in a follow-up. And then geospatial is something we're actively working on. Um, and so I think we're going to, to solve most of those. But Postgres compatibility is important. And yes, you're right. The idea was let's get the fundamental building blocks done right first, and then we will continue to enhance the product to add more and additional capabilities. Yeah, let's not just reuse the whole engine that was already built in open source and try to make it work in this new world. Let's actually architect from the ground up to make the whole thing work for this, this new world of distributed computing, yep. right? And so I want to come back to something you said, Tim. Hmm. Um, and typically when I go through this conversation, people always have like, why not do store procedures, right? Store procedures seem like one of these things that like, you know, people use, right? It's, it's like, you know, it's a, uh, I always didn't like them, but I'm, I'm channeling other people right now. 
right? So why don't we do stored procedures? This is a public webinar, is it not? Yeah, I, yeah. you have to be careful what I say, don't I? Shoot, <laughs> darn it. Well, I may ask Rachel. I want this hot take. Hot take, hot take, watch out. Um, why do we not do stored procedures? Um, boy, it's a complicated answer and one I have obviously very strong personal opinions on. I, I think we are looking at the problem, um, if, I'm being, if I'm being honest from a product level, I think we're looking at it. Um, the reality is stored procedures tend to be very, very database centric um, and, and no two stored procedure implementations are really that much alike. And so given our, our lean toward Postgres compatibility, um, you know, any stored procedure flavor we might build would look a lot like Postgres, which still doesn't help people who are coming from other languages uh, and databases that are, are, are bigger users of stored procedures. Having said all of that, I think the general consensus in the market, and there's a great article uh, about this, but, you know, if you were to go to most dev conferences and, um, you know, look at most, uh, you know, top articles and in all the big blogs and all the places that kind of modern architecture is, is thought about and talked about, um, you don't see a lot of people advocating for the use of stored procedures. It's very much um, kind of something from the past that, that almost every company we work with is actively working to migrate away from. So the way I look at it is it's, it's a vestige of, of some old architectural concepts. It's not part of kind of the modern canon of software or database development. And um, while I understand the need to have them for people who are actively trying to migrate off of legacy systems, it's really not part of what I think kind of modern software development looks like generally. Right. There's always arguments and, and it does become a, to some extent a very, a very painful and, and uh, religious battle at times, but we just don't see it being adopted in new development. Um, and we don't see it being advocated outside of a few vendors who have a vested interest in and making it um, relevant. Right. And I think, Tim, like, you know, originally, I mean, if I think back, you know, it was because of, you know, I wanted a central place and a, an easy way to actually overlay a different layer of security within a, within a procedure for the data in the database. Or from a performance point of view, I would set up a huge box somewhere because this, this monolithic database was running on this machine and I can get like some performance gains by using a stored procedure, right? Or, or basically it was kind of like one place to, to centralize a function to abstract that an API, if you will, right, mm -hmm. like for a bunch of users, right? And, and it was kind of like, I always thought like those were the three key reasons why stored procedures even came about in the first place. I think in the modern distributed world, I don't, to me, they just make no sense. Like create a Lambda function, create a microservice, put all that capability in there, wrap it with some really tight security. And by the way, check it in and check it out at GitHub too, by the way, because I'm telling you what, your stored procedure shouldn't be an element of the database that's checked in and out with the DDL, right? Like, oh, sure. you know, it should be versioned, it should be unit tested, like, and all those problems, I think, with stored procedures can be yeah. solved in a different way. Yeah, I totally agree. We, we just, we, we don't see it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's not that people don't ask about it. It's just that it's all oftentimes, I've got this big ball of mud, the proverbial big ball of mud, which is a great, interesting computer science paper, by the way. Um, and I'm trying to get rid of it. If you could help me get rid of it by implementing a, something that looks like store procedures, great. If not, we're rewriting these things anyway. So, right. you know, we'll just, we'll catch them on the flip side. Yeah, I think there's things that we can do within the database that will like store procedure-y, mm -hmm. uh, but a one-to-one -one mapping uh, doesn't make sense in a distributed world. And it, it, that's my opinion. Again, I think it's a, this is why you said, is this a public debate or a, you know, I think there's a lot of, Jeez. there's a Don't lot of this. on this inside and out the company, right? I yeah. think we've all seen it. So. These so, are just my opinions. I know, right? This is, I don't speak on behalf of my I team don't. or my, I do speak on behalf of my company. Yeah. Um, last thing, you know, and we talked a little bit about this before. So typically when people are deploying a database, um, you know, they think of the, the DDL, uh, they think of, you know, what the scheme is for the tables and all this. With Cockroach, it's a little bit different, right? You've got to think about some other things too, right? So Rich, what, are the, what do people have to think about when they start thinking about Cockroach? It's different beyond the, the logical schema. Well, uh, this is my understanding, but I've, I have not run a big database that's like multi-region and stuff. So maybe Tim will jump in with some you know, production knowledge here, but you got to think about data latencies, right? You got, you have, Right. So we haven't, we can't fix the speed of light. Like, you know, the speed of light still exists. So if you have machines in different places, they need to have good, strong network connections. You have to have good time synchronization because, you know, the, 
time protocol as part of how we, uh, you know, keep in sync. It's part of how RAF works, machines having a sort of logical clocks to interact with each other. So you do have to think about that. And then, you know, another thing that we kind of offer, and I'm, I'm not so familiar with the exact nitty gritty details on it, but basically if you want data to live in certain regions because of regulatory requirements or because of your latency needs for customers in certain areas of the world or of a country or whatever, then you are gonna have to think, you know, about how you're setting up your clusters layout topology, I believe we call it. We have a bunch of docs for this, which I didn't write, so I'm not super familiar with them, but we have a list of topology patterns, network oh, yeah. topology patterns, where it takes you through these like three, four, five sort of common patterns and like, what are you trying to do in a distributed manner uh, what, what are your goals? Is it fast reads? Is it fast writes? Are you trying to get the best of both worlds? Are you distributed in these different countries or different regions, whatever? So I would say that's a big thing to think about, especially if you're a bigger, if you're a bigger deployment, that's yeah. trying to do more, more, uh, yeah, I, I love how Rich says, you know, oh, geez, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if, if I can answer this. All right. I'm not sure if I know. And then proceeds to deliver the perfect answer. <laughs> All right. I haven't done any of it. That's the thing, you know. I just read things. But you have a thousand times. No, it's good stuff. I, no, you're right. I mean, I, I you know, th th just to follow up. I mean, it, the thing you have to be aware of with cockroach, if you want to be aware of it, depending upon the topology of of the of the uh, the deployment, is where data lives. Because again, part of our story here. I mean, the fundamental part of our story is we're a highly resilient and performant database because we break down the database into small atomic chunks and distribute them over a wide geography. The wider the geography, the longer it takes for nodes to communicate, potentially the slower things can get. So an understanding where data lives in a cluster that is uh, geographically dispersed is an important concept. But I will say this, Jim, I mean, we go to great lengths, I think, to make this again transparent. You can you can tune and, and make adjustments to your schema and topology if you yeah. want to, uh, in order to, um, you know, to, to deal with kind of where data lives. Um, but Cockroach also has some, some features and functionality that kind of will handle a lot of this for you transparently. So things like, you know, follow the workload, things like, um, oh, what's the other one that I always get, uh, I get tripped up on? Follow the workload. Oh, follow the workload. What did I say? Follow. I said follow reads and follow the workload. To follow it gets me tripped up both times. But anyway, uh, so th there are things that we can do to to make this environment work, or this database work very, very well without you having to get super specific about certain things. And I think what's interesting, Tim, is you can do that up front. Like we could think about the, the the definition of the tables and then where data needs to live based on what you want to survive and how fast you want access to that data. Because if I want to just survive data, I'm going to write it in three different regions. So if a region goes down, I could survive anything, right? Like, and it really comes down. The beauty is we can change this in production without any downtime. You know, the beauty is we can, we can do online schema changes, even to the primary key, which allows us to, you know, to, to control where data lives in this cluster, which is, you know, to me, one of those, those concepts that's just phenomenal about Cockroach. It's a bit cranial. It's a little bit more advanced, but once you get these concepts, it's extremely powerful. Because ultimately, if I think about that stuff, it really comes back to latency. Um, and, and my favorite thing to say is, you know, we get questions all the time about competition and like, you know, competitors will call us out for X, Y, and Z and this, that, and the other, and, and all these things. And I, I always joke because it's kind of like, well, I'm not in competition with them. Like we're in competition with the speed of light. Like literally, like that is our ultimately goal. Like every night we run performance tests and, and and, you know, Andy Kimball, one of the leaders on our engineering team, you know, I, I remember an internal presentation just to give a little bit, of, Rich, you're nodding your head. Remember, it was like, what are we ultimately chasing here? And it's the speed of light. And and the ultimate goal here is is physics, man. Like, in, and like, we're doing some incredible software engineering to, to, to rise to that challenge of competition. Because if, if people want to get into like performance battles, that's great. Let's just talk truly like, distributed environments, because I think the future is is truly distributed. I think that the future, when we have 5G and we have, you know, 100 megabit connections on every phone all the time, what's that going to mean for us across an entire planet? Everybody, like, literally, like, we're, 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 we're solving for problems that I don't think people realize they have yet sometimes, and, and, and we aren't going to get to. And, and for us, it's like, let's build for, 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 you know, three years from now and make it valuable for today. And, and to me, it's the speed of light.
and, and, and understanding the speed of light, what that means for the data and where it lives and, and the controls, I think is the, the key thing. And I, I just, I like getting there and, and we're, we are at the top of the hour, guys. But um, Tim, thank you. Thank you very much. And Rich, You're thank welcome. you very much. So thank you guys. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, you guys. Um, so last thing I would like to do just before we sign off here is uh, one quick thing I need to show. Oh boy, where is it? Oh, here we go. Um, so thank you guys again for joining. Um, if anybody here on the webinar wants to get started really easily, just go to our website, get Cockroach DB. It's upper right-hand corner. It's on every page. It's in the it's in the thing. You can start a cluster today running in the cloud and then in, in, in a short time, uh, we'll give you a 30 day free trial of a cluster. Um, you could download the bits and install on your laptop. That's what you know we were talking about. Go check out the documentation. I'll tell you how to install the whole thing. Use Cockroach Demo, get the thing up and running uh, either places. So um, get started today, go out and play with it, interact with us. Um, we have a, a wildly interesting Slack channel, a public Slack channel, a community Slack channel as well. So if you have any questions, we're happy to engage with you there as well. Um, but on behalf of Tim and Rich, um, thank you everybody for taking an hour of your day today to spend with us. I certainly enjoyed myself, guys. I hope you did as well. Did you? Yes, thank you. I did. It's always a pleasure working with you two, always. <laughs> it's always a pleasure just to get in a random conversation because we aren't in the office anymore either. I gotta, I gotta forget that this is recorded in an actual webinar, not just you and I having an internal chat. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful, Tim, so. Okay, so everybody, thank you and have a great day. See ya, bye now. Bye.